Today on the Everything 80s Podcast, we are looking back at the sitcom Small Wonder. She's a small wonder, lovely and bright and soft girls. She's a small wonder, a child unlike other girls. She's a miracle. She's a small wonder, and she'll make your heart dream like la 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 Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie, and we're looking back on a kind of iconic and also creepy as hell sitcom from the 80s, Small Wonder. And I'm assuming you hopefully remember this if you've clicked on this episode. If not, this is a good look back on what is honestly a hard to describe show. It's during a time of like real boom and growth in, in the TV industry as far as new shows and sitcoms and everything like that. Small Wonder, like, I don't know, it captured a bit of the 80s. It also had this like 1950s sort of feel to it. it we'll look back at everything, how the show was developed, the people involved, its success, how long it lasted, everything like that. Hopefully you'll like this. But before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Stitcher Radio. I should be there. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so as a quick summary to put this all together, Small Wonder is a science fiction sitcom based on a 10-year-old robot called Vicky, who is created by an engineer named Ted Lawson, who tries to pass her off as his adopted daughter. And it ran from September 1985 to May 1989. And again, like I loved Small Wonder. I was a big fan of it. And it, it seemed like it was part uh, sitcom and, like I said, part futuristic prediction. It was like, you know, looking at the first AI that we were familiar with. The, the show's creators seem pretty sure that having artificial intelligence was definitely going to be part of the future. And maybe she was like the predecessor to the Terminator or something like that. But a lot of, yeah, interesting and weird things about the show. One thing, Small Wonder was rare for a sitcom and that it ran on Saturdays, uh, which is really weird. But that meant it was easy for it to be found by a young market. Again, it also had that, uh, what makes it memorable is that theme song that we played at the start. And again, that gave it that that wholesome 50s sitcom type vibe um and you know it, it's a funny show like it's more juvenile humor again because like knowing the audience range but then at the same time it still included some inappropriate stuff at the whole time i don't know there, it's it's a lot but small wonder was created by howard leeds who co-created silver spoons also worked on different strokes he was a child actor himself and worked on a show in the 1960s called My Living Doll that featured a young Julie Newmar who was Catwoman in, Bat in the Batman series. This show was about an android trying to blend in with society. So that's obviously going to carry over here too. And a quick rundown on the premise, uh, if it's been a while and you forgot, is that the child robot is named Vicky, V-I-C-I, which stands for Voice Input Child Identicant. And this always made me think of the replicants in Blade Runner. I don't know, for some reason. So maybe maybe Small Wonder was a child's version of, of Blade Runner in some aspect. But so like Vicky is an android of a 10-year-old girl built by Ted Lawson, who is an engineer inventor for United Robotronics. So Vicky was created as a way in, within the show to assist handicapped children, and Ted brings her home so she can mature and learn about a family environment, almost like a, a guide dog or a dog that um, helps whatever situation. So she's Vicky's kind of like Iron Man in a sense. She has superhuman strength and speed. She's also very functional, and she has uh, an AC outlet under her right arm. She has a data port under her left arm. You can access uh, all her controls on a panel on her back. I don't know if she had an upgraded USB port or wireless charging, but whatever. She speaks in a monotone robotic voice, 
and if you remember has the ability to elongate her neck like she's inspector gadget some other abilities she had she can shrink down to the size of a doll a la ant-man she can grow to 10 feet tall so she is basically ant-man she could channel electricity through her hands like the emperor so she could like do stuff like jump start a car or even a person's heart she possessed a superpowered learning ability to do things like improve products or extend gas mileage on cars. So I wonder if the government hasn't actually been working on secret Vickies this whole time. And now, look, I, I think not using Vicky as an Avenger was a huge missed opportunity at some point. She could have definitely held her own. Um, so as, in kind of an elf uh, type move, the family tries to pass off Vicky as one of their own and as an adopted child who has been unfortunately orphan. So the Lawson family now has to try and keep her existence a secret also like Alf, but it's hard because of their neighbors, the Brindles and in Alf, it was the Achmonic. So there's always those foils. The Brindles, if you remember, are always showing up when it's inconvenient, especially remember the annoying as hell daughter, Harriet with the red hair. So her father is co-workers with Ted. So, I mean, it's just set up for pure wackiness here. So let's look at some of the actors of Small Wonder. So the most important one is Vicky herself. And so her name is Victoria Vicky Ann Smith Lawson. She was played by Tiffany Brissett. And I'll give you some just quick fun facts on some of these people. She did a voice in the uh, Caravan of Courage and Ewok Adventure, if you remember that TV show. She also did voices on The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. Ted Lawson was played by Dick Christie, who was on a lot of classics in the 80s, like Who's the Boss, Knott's Landing, Newhart, uh, The Ropers. He was even in uh, Breaking Bad for a little bit. Joan Lawson, the mother, was played by Marla Pennington. She was on shows like Different Strokes, Magnum P.I., Charles in Charge, Happy Days, even was on The Incredible Hulk. Jamie Lawson, the brother, was played by Jerry Suprian. He was on shows like Little House in the Prairie, Mr. Belvedere, Highway to Heaven. Harriet Brindle was played by Emily Shulman. She also appeared on ALF and The Wonder Years. Uh, she was in Troop Beverly Hills, if you remember that movie. So that's the main characters. Some of the other characters, again, uh, Harriet's parents were Brandon and Bonnie. She had an aunt named Ida May. And then there was like random friends of Jamie's. And then if you know the show well, you'll remember Vanessa. That was the evil robot who looked just like Vicky but did not speak in a monotone voice. So this is kind of like the small wonder version of uh, Stefan Urkel from Family Matters. Okay, so looking at the actual production of the show and creating some of the technical shots, you wouldn't think that a sitcom would have that many issues filming as they te they tend to be very straightforward multi-camera shows you know on a soundstage but because vicky was basically like you know johnny five from short circuit the show required a lot of technical shots to showcase some of those abilities we were talking about before there were actual genuine special effects um and special effects shots that made use of very primitive versions of green screen before this was sort of commonplace but it was the only way they could sort of put this all together so some of these type shots, for example, would be, say, when Vicky's head would spin around like she was Linda Blair in The Exorcist. Um, you know, what, some of the other examples like her strength, like, such as, you know, she'd be able to lift an entire couch with one arm to vacuum under it. And that, you know, these seem simple and sort of primitive um, special effect shots at the time, but were legitimate um, technical um, creations that needed to be. Uh, filmed for TV and that was one of the reasons they couldn't have a studio audience so they would have to devote all of Thursdays um, to set up and record those special effects shots so this put a lot of uh, real damper on the shooting schedule because sitcoms most sitcoms didn't have to worry about issues like this about <clears throat> special effects shots you know you don't uh, you don't remember Alex P. Keaton shooting lasers out of his hands uh, on family ties to warm up the soup so most of those special effects shots, of course, would just be Vicky. So they didn't have to bring in the other cast members. Um, so that took even more time to have to get them ready for wardrobe and makeup. And it was a longer, more grueling shoot compared to your regular show. That leads into some of the problems that happened over the course of the series with the cast and the show. According to interviews with the cast, they all got along really well. But it was the parents of the child actors who caused 
a lot of the crap that went down on the sets. All the parents of the three different kids demanded specific tutors on set, each individually for their own kids. So they uh, they couldn't agree on the same one. So they, three individual tutors were brought in. All the parents didn't get along at all. So even though the kids were like getting along well, the parents created all the unnecessary tension on the set. They would always clash with each other uh, and the other cast members and some of the other, um, you know, production staff and cast members themselves remarked that the parents were acting like they were the stars of the show. People like that, uh, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> the adult cast members on the show also weren't really knowing what they were making. They were aware it was a kid's show, but like I said, look back on this thing if you haven't seen it for a while. There's a lot of really weird sort of sexual innuendos, and I don't remember it being that sort of creepy, especially with Ted and his wife and him being all over him, uh, over her. Marla Pennington, who played Mother Jones, saw it as not, she didn't really consider it her best work at all. And a lot of the other staff would, uh, or cast would agree with that. They just found it uh, just a paying job, just, you know, just to make end meet, ends meet. So she also thought the show sounded very sketchy. And some of the writers hated having to write like drivel like this. The mother would often be introduced in the start of episodes chopping carrots specifically to show how thinly drawn the character was that they were, the writers actually wrote in these little snubs at the show. Writers had to write so few pages of dialogue. They were said to wonder if they were working on a sitcom or an oil painting. <laughs> That's a quote um, from them. So if you ever, if you're going back and watching the show, or if you own it for whatever reason, look out for those scenes where the mother is, is chopping carrots and that's, yeah, that little inside dig. So then what's important to look at is the specific issues for Vicky herself played by Tiffany Brissett. So most might not know it um, due to, you know, her having to play a robotic character on the show. And she, this actress, Tiffany doesn't seem very, you know, she's just going through these monotone lines and it doesn't seem like a, actual role or she needed any real skill but she was a extremely multi-talented actress who could sing dance she did gymnastics she played instruments she did competitive horse jumping like you name it she did it she was even up for the role of punky brewster which i could definitely have seen her play she was picked out tiffany Brissett was picked out of 400 different girls for the role but because of like the one dimensionalness of playing a robot, she was stuck in that character the whole time. So you might be watching thinking like this kid isn't really talented, but she was. She got extremely frustrated as she was stuck in this role with the same outfit and really couldn't show off any of her real abilities. She's giving these monotone performances but isn't able to engage with the rest of the cast within the show. You can actually see her biting her cheek sometimes because she's having to stop herself from laughing at like the punchline jokes or any of the other funny lines that the other cast are saying. Brissette's mother would also cause issues backstage and, and push more for her daughter and to showcase her abilities. But again, you sort of had to know what you're signing up for when you're playing a robot. She's also involved herself with having to do all those technical shots alone, which would take a lot of time, trial and error. So Brissette would later leave show business and go on and become a nurse in Boulder, Colorado. There's actually a clip you can see on YouTube where they do a surprise reunion on air um, with the cast and her crew members back in 2007, if you want to check that out. So let's look at the impact and sort of the success of Small Wonder. It was a pretty big hit. It was geared towards younger viewers, uh, but they were able to capitalize on getting a decent sized audience because it was on Saturday mornings, which again was pretty unheard of then for a live action show, let alone a sitcom. I mean, this is obviously dominated by Saturday morning cartoons till they all went away. And then that made it so they didn't have any real competition. So it was again, easier to attract an audience. The show would debut on September 7th, 1985. They would do four seasons covering 96 episodes and the ratings were pretty solid over the course of the four years. Oh, the seasons would average anywhere from seven to eight million viewers, which again, for a Saturday morning, was pretty good. You're getting a good chunk of the audience. A big thing Small Wonder did, which was 
very pioneering at the time, was syndicate their original first run series. This basically means that it started out as a syndicated show. It's kind of like going direct to video. And this is an approach used by studios as it was cheaper to produce and way less expensive to air than a primetime series. So because of that, Small Wonder had an actual, you know, very, very low price tag per episode, around $300,000. Again, that's, you know, pretty evident in the low budget appearance of the show, not to mention the, you know, kind of lackluster special effects. But again, this is 1985 and they weren't working with industrial light and magic. So besides North America, Small Wonder was a huge hit in Italy, also in France, India, and then in Brazil. And it was dubbed into 52 different languages. I think a lot of that is because, again, like the, the writer's men is such a simple script. There's not a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of cookie cutter stuff. So it translate well. It translates well to other countries where you can just sort of take the show at face value. Uh, there's not a lot that's lost to um, translation or interpretation. So again, it's funny. In a lot of these countries, the show was actually called Super Vicky, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the actors started to become quite popular and were getting mobbed the odd time while out in public. And the show is also loved by senior citizens. So again, it the audience started to grow and grow. But again, it didn't last too long. I mean, it lasted four seasons, which is not too bad. But I mean, you, you can only go with that same premise um, and situation for so long. I mean, like how many stories can you tell or how many different variations of the story can you tell about this robot living in the house and getting up to whatever shenanigans? You know what I mean? Like you sort of run the well dry after a while. So like I said, I liked Small Wonder at the time. I think I was in the right age range that it appealed to me because I was around, what, eight or nine years old when it first debuted. So it, it, it worked, you know, for kids of that age it followed the usual again run-of-the-mill sitcom tropes but it was definitely it was creative you know and it deserves some respect for that as weird as it is it constantly shows up though on those like worst shows of the 80s list but again it wasn't trying to be something it wasn't you know what i mean it it, it was the cheapest sitcom of the time to produce and it was noted that it was impossible for it not to make money due to its low cost so I get that. It was a pretty easy route to a quick buck, and that might have been the ultimate intent with the show. They needed to put something out, um, and there was no, due to this new like syndication thing they were following, there was no way for it not to make money. And it allowed them still at the same time, you know, to entertain and connect with people around the world. And it actually connected and spread a lot further than they were anticipating, like, you know, to reach Brazil and India and France. They, they didn't think that was going to be the case. They thought, you know, this will maybe just be a couple seasons. But it really turned into, like, the little show that could. I mean, they were first not anticipating it, you know, lasting more than one season. And, again, that's why they did it, the syndication route. So it's every show they were making. You know, if you're putting a show together for prime time, there's so much more cost that goes into it because you're having to get into that network prime time slot and then, you know, working with the advertisers. Um, there, there's different, you know, um, sort of etiquettes and, and scenarios and logistics and technical specifications they need to get in there. But when you're basically recording this show for syndication, it's like you record all these shows and they're ready and then they can go out anywhere and at any time and you're not limited to whatever. So that let it work. So the writers would know how they were constantly shocked at the high ratings and they were like, okay, this will last, you know, it might only last 12 seasons or 12 episodes. And then like they got a full season and they're like, Oh, well maybe they'll only do it for another six or eight. And then it lasts another entire season. These writers are essentially, you know, when they finish one episode, they're like getting their resume ready to look for new work, not thinking it's going to last. And then it's consistently pulling in seven to 8 million viewers a week. So it, the high ratings, it kept them in work, even though it wasn't necessarily something they wanted to be working on or to have on their resume when it was tough to find any jobs in any um, genre of writing, whether it's, you know, movies or dramas or sitcoms, they were able to keep going. And it's just amazing that they notal notably say how consistently shocked they were at the high ratings. So to finish up, you know, it, it had its moment. Uh, everyone, again, if you grew up at the time, everyone remembers it. 
I, I would say so, you know, if you're a, a kid or whatever grew up or was alive during the 80s. So if you can be remembered during a period where there was so much pop culture happening uh, through TVs, movies, music, video games, whatever. So if you can be remembered, it's kind of all you can ask for when you're trying to make a mark on pop culture or in entertainment in general. So ultimately that would have to say you're a success of some sort. Okay, let's finish it up there. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to check this show out. I know there's a ton of podcasts out there, so the fact you've spent this little bit of time with me means a lot. Again, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. If you really like it, leave it a rating and review. That way more people get to check it out. But that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Bye.